Hello! <clears throat> Guten Morning, as uh, Isaac has said in my uh, terrible German accent. Um, how's it going? Ready to review some more Unit 3? Ugh, continue our discussion of our Unit 3 review. Uh, Isabel says, good morning. Isaac's tired. Maggie says, hello. <sighs> Isabel, how's the uh, FF7 remake? Six fifty. That's early, Isaac. That's like when I woke up. Yeah, that's like when I woke up. It's a rainy, rainy day, rainy day. But it's like that weird rain that's just drizzly. Oh gosh, five a.m. <laughs> Zoom at eight. What class do you have uh, Zoom for that early? Uh, I was in the middle of teaching my BYU class when the earthquake went off, Isaac, but and it or Austin. Uh, it was really close to my house because I'm out on the west side. Seminary? You have Zoom meeting for seminary? That's weird. I hadn't even thought about what seminary is doing. I, I guess I just kind of assumed that they, like, just didn't do it. Huh. <laughs> Only on Wednesdays. Seminary's so much harder, really, Maggie? <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> Lauren says it's a party. I wonder if it changes by your teacher. <clears throat> Oh, so they're only doing it like one day of the week. That's weird. Huh. If I was a seminary, I would still do it every day. I feel like you need it every day, but I only do it for like, I do it for like a half hour every day. Weird, weird, weird. Hey, Micah. Ugh. Canvas every day? What do you do on your canvas? Like, just record, like, reading walks or something? Weird. That's weird. Huh. Weird. Cool. Um, yeah, Micah, I agree. Online school's a little rough. Um, answer questions and watch videos. That's interesting. Oh, discussions. Sure. Okay. That's interesting. That's cool, I guess. I mean, that's cool that they're keeping up with it. I kind of assumed that they would just not. So, huh. Cool. Mm. <laughs> yeah, but Isabel, is it any... Is it that just because of poor time management or the fact that you have to watch little siblings or um, is it really that much work than it is than normal school would have been? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, I can see that. I'm trying to be a little more lenient. <laughs> Sammy's, Sammy's loving online. Everybody, Sammy's, Sammy's loving online. I don't, I don't mind it. I don't mind it too much. Um, so I, I try to keep announcements to a minimum. I know that some teachers are like emailing you every day. Um, so I, I, I try to only send out mass emails like once a month. Um, and I have all the information there and everything's updated on Canvas. So yeah, sleeping in is nice. If you don't have to wake up till like eight, that's totally nice. Yeah, missing people is true. Missing people is a big deal. Does Hodges send out emails every day? Oh, gosh. Uh, speed run portal. Glitchless? Or are you doing full glitches? 
Because full glitches, can't you speedrun Portal in like three minutes? Really? Everyone's not. Everyone just Micah. Everyone should be doing everything on Canvas. Uh, if they're doing a bunch of other websites, they're not doing it right. Um, Marin, extra toasty cheese. What are you even saying? <laughs> oh, inbounds. No major glitches. Okay, that that's actually a decent speed run. Ma oh, the math teacher. Are, oh, extra toasty cheese its Okay, I got you. To sell the burnt ones? Yeah. <laughs> Why would you buy extra toasty cheese its um, I'm not telling them how to do their jobs. I'm telling them what we have been instructed as faculty. So. <clears throat> they were out of regular ones. Okay, that makes sense. Um... Minecraft, speedrunning Minecraft. 90 seconds. Beat the Elder Dragon. <laughs> okay, let's, let's actually get started. Um, we're on random tangents. Um, okay. This is, no, what's it called? Not the Elder Dragon. It's called the, the Nether Dragon. I don't know. I've never played Minecraft. Oh, Ender Dragon. Goodness, I just got spammed. So when my when my son gets a little older, um, I'll probably play Minecraft with him. Um, but right now he's a little young. He's only four. So when he gets to be like five or six and he starts showing some interest, I'll play Minecraft with him. Um, it'll be fun to do. He's four. Your brother. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Gases. So let's talk about gases. So the first thing we want to say about gases is um, we have, number one, the ideal gas law. Right? So with our ideal gas law, of course, PV equals NRT. Now, PV equals NRT is on the equation sheet for the AP test. Um, they define P as pressure, V as volume, N as the number of moles. Uh, they give you the value of R as 0.0826 liter atmospheres per Kelvin mole, or they give you the uh, 8.31 joules per mole Kelvin, so both are there. Uh, and then temperature, of course, has to be in Kelvin. Okay. Um, so that's our equation for the ideal gas law. Um, we also had some other equations. Um, so we remember the law of partial pressures. Right? Where in any mixture, the total pressure, P total, is equal to the pressure of gas A plus the pressure of gas B, plus the pressure of gas C, on and on and on and on. Um, <clears throat> this also led into this idea of this other equation where the pressure of gas A was equal to the mole fraction of gas A times the total pressure. So remember this chi represented mole fraction. And mole fraction, of course, is just the, the moles of the part over the total moles. So this would be the moles of gas A divided by the total moles. Um, and so our pressure of a given gas in a sample is equal to the mole fraction of that gas times the total pressure. You can also rearrange this equation and say, if you take the pressure of a gas and divide by the total pressure, that's also the mole fraction. So the pressure fraction and the mole fraction are the same. And so the, the fraction of the molecules and the fraction of the pressure is uh, equivalent to each other. Um, yeah, these are both on the blue sheet. Actually, all three of these equations are on the blue sheet.
Okay, uh, last thing, we'll make sure we understand relationships. Uh, same side, inverse, opposite sides, direct, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, but I don't actually have Valorant drops, <laughs> my guy. Okay, so what I mean here, so P and V, since they're on the same side of the equation, have an inverse relationship. And N and T, because they're on the same side of the equation, they have an inverse relationship. P and N and P and T and V and N and V and T are all direct, right? So these are inverse and these are direct. Yeah, we, we stomped them, DJ. They, <laughs> it, was, it was pretty gross. Um, Brighton's, Brighton's uh, League of Legends team is the best in the state. Um, Park City is actually really good. We haven't played Park City this season. Um, so between either, it's either Park City or us as a uh, best in the state of Utah. Park City's got a really good team too. Okay, so P and V, N and T are inverse. Um, whereas pressure and moles, pressure and temperature, volume and moles, volume and temperature are all direct. So it just kind of make sure you understand the relationships between them. And so if, if pressure goes up, volume has to go down. If moles go up, temperature has to go down. Um, no, we are. It's not a flex. It's true. Okay, and then these ones, of course, are direct. So if pressure goes up, moles goes up. Pressure goes up, temperature goes up. Volume goes up, moles goes up. Volume goes up, temperature goes up. Okay. Um, and that's pretty much it for the ideal gas law. Um, <clears throat> so technically, Isaac, when we say something like, when we talk about the relationship between pressure and volume, we have to assume that the other ones are being held constant. Um, if we look at moles and temperature, we have to assume that pressure and volume are held constant. So it, it, it has a, a, li a slightly limited application to it. Um, but it is still important to understand how those relationships work. Um, cool. Okay. Uh, let's go to... So it's like the really, oh, um, yeah, technically true. If everything is being multiplied, then it, it, the same side is direct and the, or sorry, the same side is inverse and opposite side of direct. Um, if you throw fractions in there, it kind of messes with the inverse direct proportionalities. But if you have everything being multiplied together, like in the ideal gas law, then the same side inverse opposite side direct is true. if everything's being multiplied. All right, um, number dos, number two. Um, let's talk about, um, kinetic molecular theory. Uh, kinetic like the theory, right? So KMT talks about, um, you know, all these other things. So one of the first things we have to talk about is temperature. So kind of give a definition of what temperature is. Temperature is a measure of the average random kinetic energy. Right, so temperature is a measure of the average random kinetic energy. Uh, we define kinetic energy as being equal to one half the mass times the velocity squared. Right? 
this equation is also on the blue sheet. <laughs> Sorry, Philip. Mm. Uh, you should use one of those apple slicers. And so that way you can eat the apple with your left hand and right with your right hand. You, can't you eat an apple with your left hand? Wouldn't that be the more practical thing to do? Okay, so because kinetic energy is one half the mass times velocity squared, that means temperature is also related to the mass and the velocity, right? So this leads to, oh, he's on the left page. This leads to what's called a, a Boltzmann distribution. So Boltzmann distribution. So well, that's pretty good. So on the y-axis, we have proportion of molecules. On the x-axis, we have uh, average velocity, or actually not average velocity, but velocity. Technically speed, but I don't care. Um, the Boltzmann constant is not something you need to know, Naya. Um, it does kind of explain the graph, um, but it doesn't, you, you're not going to ever use that in an equation. Okay. So uh, reminder that when we look at a graph like this, um, the average is going to be um, just to the right of the peak. Okay, so here's our average at this and our average at that. If we say, you know, this dashed line represents an initial temperature and the solid line represents some final temperature, um, what conclusions can we make about the two temperatures and this graph? How do they relate to each other? If this is the distribution of the molecules at temperature two and this is the distribution of the molecules at temperature one. What can we say about the two temperatures? Mm, careful, Bryce. If our average velocity is greater with T2, temperature two is actually greater. Right? <clears throat> Temperature one is higher in the fact that there's more molecules, but those molecules are moving slower. We're looking at the velocity. So a higher velocity, like we get with T2, is going to represent higher. So at higher temperatures, a Boltzmann distribution um, flattens. So at low temperatures, you get a big spike and then a slow tail. But at higher temperatures, that curve kind of flattens out. So here's our low temperature. Here's our high temperature. Low velocity, high velocity. Okay, um, I think that's all I wanted to do. Yep. Okay, number three. Uh, Non-ideal, aka real gases. Um, so what caused deviations from ideality, right? Um, wh what were the what were the factors that affected gases behaving ideal? Naya, you always complain about your buffering videos. Do you just have bad internet? Yeah, so we had conditions. So Mary points out the conditions. So low temperature and high pressures. So gases tend to be less ideal at low temperatures and high pressures. And then if we look at the molecules themselves, if they have greater attractions, so let's see, less ideal 
uh, with greater attractive forces. And there was one last thing. So less I deal with greater attractive forces on my end. I'm not dropping any frames. I'm not uh, doing anything. So everything should be going through good. So it's on your end. Uh, it's the size, yeah, the volume compared to the total volume. Yeah, Sarah and Mary got it. So it's so it's less ideal with greater attractive forces and larger um, molecule size. So big thick boys. Yeah, sometimes reloading the page helps uh, Philip. Sometimes it it doesn't. It just kind of depends. So. Um, you also could lower the, you could lower the quality, the video quality. Like you could drop it down to 720p instead of 1080p. Um, that might help if your internet's struggling. Yeah, or I mean, you could lower it all the way down to 480, but then you might not be able to have enough resolution to see the text. So, oh yes, <laughs> getting rid of some tabs will uh, help as well because Chrome likes to eat all your memory. All right, so let's talk about kind of why these things are. So remember, it's less ideal low temperatures because at low temperatures, your molecules are moving slower, right? And so if your molecules are moving slower, when they bounce into each other, they're more likely to stick, which makes it non-ideal. The ideal gas law assumes that your gas particles perfectly bounce into each other. Um, but if, you're, if your molecules are moving slower, they're more likely to kind of stick when they bounce because they're getting closer to becoming liquids. And liquids aren't gases, liquids are liquids. And so if you have low temperatures, their molecules are sticking. You have very high pressures, your molecules are also kind of you know stuck together in a really tight quarters. And so that also you start to get some um, sticking. Um, are you sure, Naya, it only gives you the option for 1080? You should be able to lower the quality if you click the little gear in the bottom right. Weird. That's really weird. Huh. I wonder why you can't change the quality. Okay, so everybody apparently... I thought you could change the quality. You usually can. Huh. Oh, I mean, maybe set it to auto? It might lower the quality then. I wonder if that's something I can change in my end that I can broadcast in... No, I shouldn't. Be. I don't know. Anyway, sorry. An ideal liquid law. No, <laughs> there is no ideal liquid law. Sorry, Isaac. Um, okay, so uh, less ideal low temperature and high pressures because they start sticking to each other. Um, less ideal with greater attractive forces because, again, that idea of... Um, yeah, because what happens is if it's because your collisions are um, not elastic and one of the assumptions of the ideal gas law is that the you have elastic collisions meaning that they bounce perfectly and so if the attractive forces um, actually stick to each other or the molecules actually are attracted to each other then those collisions aren't truly elastic and that causes deviations from ideality one frame per second Okay. Um, good. Okay, that's all. That's all there is for gases. So that leads us to letter D. Big D. Um, solutions. Uh, this probably should be a question, what determines molecular size? It's just simply the number of atoms and molecules, right? So CH4 has a certain size, and then like C3H8 is a much larger molecule. 
you also could look at like the periodic table. Uh, reminder, as we go down a group, um, the atoms get bigger and bigger and bigger. And so like iodine, if you have iodine molecules are gonna be much larger than say fluorine. And so gaseous iodine is going to be less ideal than gaseous fluorine. Um, so that's a great question, Sarah. I don't remember for sure if if fusion and diffusion are on there. Um, if they do, I think they're more conceptual than anything. You're not going to actually have to calculate like how much faster one gas effuses than another, but you should know that a lower molar mass gas at the same temperature is going to have a higher velocity, and that kind of relates back to. Um, you know, our ideal gas, or not. It, it relates back to this kinetic energy idea being related to mass and volume, or sorry, mass and velocity, not volume. Um, so if you have two gases at the same temperature, um, their kinetic energy is constant, uh, the lighter gas will be moving faster, and so it will effuse and diffuse faster. But I don't think you'll actually have to calculate um, like how much faster or something like that. Solutions. Um, all right. One, concentration. All right. Our gold standard for concentration is molarity. Okay. Um, there won't be any molality on the AP test. That was just kind of a, a fun thing we did when we talked about colligative properties and all that stuff. So the only, usually the only measure of concentration you're going to be dealing with is um, molarity. <laughs> oh my gosh, Philip is stuck on, on his apple. What, I made you learn something you didn't have to know for the AP test? Ah, you should be grateful. <laughs> okay, so molarity, remember molarity is defined as our moles of solute per liter of solution. Okay. Um, okay. Um, solutions is technically defined as a homogeneous mixture. Now, technically, um, solutions can be solid, liquid, or gas. We usually focus, when we talk about solutions, we usually talk about liquid solutions. Um, but things like alloys are technically a solid solution. And air, right, any gas mixture is technically a homogeneous mixture as long as there's not like clouds or particles or anything like that. But you know, the air around us is a homogeneous mixture of nitrogen and oxygen. Okay, so make sure you understand that when we say solutions, it's not just liquids, although liquids are our main focus because we talk about aqueous solutions. Um, okay, we talked about uh, heterogeneous mixtures. equals chunky, right? They're chunky. Um, heterogeneous mixtures have bits and pieces. So Isaac, I think it counts for total views. I think it counts like, um, I, I think every time I stream, I think it just counts the number of viewers for each stream and just sums it up additively. And so since I've been streaming for weeks, uh, every time I stream, it, it just tacks on numbers to it. Uh, alloys are solutions. Yes, Sarah. Alloys are solutions. You, you can use the term solution to describe an alloy. Um, okay.
Um, it, it depends. Almost most alloys, as far as I'm concerned, um, alloys are always uh, homogeneous mixtures. Um, you can have like things like concrete. That's a that's a heterogeneous mixture because it has chunks in it. It's got little bits and pieces of shells and other stuff. Um, so um, concrete is a heterogeneous mixture, but something like brass or bronze or steel is a homogeneous mixture. Okay. Um, number two. Let's talk about uh, drawings. Or I guess we'll call it models. Right. So we've we've already kind of done of this um, or done this, but make sure you remember like how to represent solutions. So we talked about like a sodium chloride solution would have sodium ions and chloride ions with the water molecules and the oxygens facing in. Right. And we could draw the chlorides with the hydrogen end facing in. Right. So make sure you understand like how to do drawings of solutions and things like that. Okay, so yeah, this is salt water, okay? Sodium chloride in solution with water. Um, okay, so understand too that um, if, you're, if you're drawing molecules, we've done a lot of this, Lauren, sorry. We've done a lot of this. Um, if we're drawing models, models you can always count atoms. So the AP test loves asking questions with pictures and they'll have something like, oh, right? They'll have like, something like this and they'll say, oh, in which box is there a higher concentration? So there's five here and there's two there, so that has a higher concentration. And, and they're that simple. So whenever you have whenever you have pictures and whenever the question asks you about a picture, um, make sure that you actually look and count. Okay. Um, if you have to draw a molecule, if you have to draw a molecule in like a solution context, it will almost always be water. Um, there will be potentially a question that might ask you to draw the Lewis structure for something, Bryce. Um, but if they're asking you to draw like how something looks dissolved in solution, uh, it'll be water that you'll be drawing. But they, they could very well ask you to draw a Lewis structure of something. Okay, number three. Separation techniques. Do I spell techniques? Why does that look so funny? Yeah, that is how you spell techniques. Do we now have to know how to draw a nonpolar molecule dissolved in a nonpolar substance? You wouldn't be asked to draw that, Mary. Um, I, I really doubt you would be asked to draw it. You might be asked to like look at a picture of it and interpret it, um, but the drawing, I, I have never seen them ask you to draw something like that. Um, I, I highly, highly doubt it. All right, so for our separation techniques, um, we had three, right? Big ones were filtration, which is good for heterogeneous mixtures. We had distillation, right? Which uses boiling point. And we had chromatography. Um, so distillation was good on boiling point, uh, boiling point separation.
Filtration, you know, kind of a simple definition. If ever you have a, a solid or a, a precipitate formed in a reaction, uh, you can just do a precipitate or a kind of a, a filtration idea where you have, you know, your solid will be left behind and your liquid goes through. Uh, distillation is often represented by, you know, something, some sort of an apparatus like this where, you know, you heat this part. That's a flame and then your one liquid boils and your other liquid comes over here. Chromatography, right, is this idea that you can use, um, you know, kind of a, a mixture and you can put, you know, you could put it in some sort of a liquid and the liquid will travel up the paper. And as the liquid travels up, you get kind of separated pieces of your mixture. Um... <laughs> do we know how to draw okay uh can you do distillation in reverse like separate gases yeah yeah yeah. so um it's it's called reverse distillation uh but it actually is when it um you can do i guess it's a separation by condensation um but yeah So yes, Maggie, you can. Uh, you can do a, a it's still called distillation, even if you do it in the reverse fashion. Um, so chromatography, real quick, or the reason I want to talk, I want to mention chromatography a little bit. Um, so for chromatography, the further, further up a substance goes, Uh, the more attracted it is to the liquid, sometimes called the mobile phase, right? Uh, the, um, the less it goes up, so the more it stays, the shorter travel distance substances are more attracted to the paper. Okay, so um, let me let me kind of sum this up a little better. So when you put a substance onto chromatography paper, they'll often have like they'll say the paper is polar, and the liquid is nonpolar, or they'll they'll switch it around, right? So if my paper is polar and my liquid is nonpolar, as the liquid rises up, the substances that rise with the liquid are more attracted to the liquid, meaning they're more polar or nonpolar, I can't remember what I said. <laughs> so the further a substance goes up, the more attracted it is to the liquid and the less attracted it is to the paper. The more a substance stays behind, right, if it only goes up a little bit, that means the more attracted it is to the paper and the less attracted it is to the liquid. And so that way you can tell like the things at the very top are gonna have the same forces as the liquid, the things at the very bottom are gonna have the same forces as the paper. Does that make sense? So chromatography can kind of be used to tell um, what kind of substances you have. Okay, hope that makes sense. Um, last thing here, this is just kind of like a, just a random statement number four. Uh, similar substances will mix. Meaning if they have similar intermolecular forces, right? Similar intermolecular forces will mix, right? And we use that term, we use the term um, miscible or soluble. as opposed to immiscible or insoluble. Okay, that's that. Um, next.
big letter D. Spectroscopy. Right, are we on big letter D? Yeah, no, sorry, big letter E. Big letter E. Yep, yep, yep. Thanks, Logan. Big letter E. Spectroscopy. Okay. So first thing we got to talk about uh, is the electromagnetic spectrum. Right. So our electromagnetic spectrum, if we remember, goes from, um, so if we start low energy, high frequency, oh, sorry, low energy, low frequency, long wavelength, right? Uh, similar substances will mix they will be miscible or soluble as well okay so spectroscopy the first thing you have to know about the electromagnetic spectrum so low energy low frequency long wavelength that is our radio waves so remember we went radio micro, infrared, visible, ultraviolet, x-ray, and gamma, which I ran out of room. And then visible goes Roy G. Biff. Right? So make sure you have memorized radio, microwave, infrared, Roy G. Biff, ultraviolet, x-ray, gamma ray. Um, and then if we want to label this side, okay, this is high energy, high frequency, short wavelength. Okay. So remember our equation for light we had two equations. We had C equals lambda nu and E equals H nu. Okay. C being the speed of light. Both of these are on the equation sheet. Speed of light, wavelength, frequency, energy, Planck's constant, um, and frequency, right? So these were our two equations that related um, wavelength, frequency, and energy. The speed of light and Planck's constant are both constants. Speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second. Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th um, joules time seconds. Wavelength is measured in meters. Frequency is measured in hertz or per seconds, s to the negative 1, 1 over s, however you want to describe it. Energy is in joules. Uh, and then frequency, like we said, hertz, s to the negative 1, 1 over s. Okay. So make sure you know these two equations. Make sure you know how to use these equations to convert from energy to frequency, frequency to wavelength, etc. Okay. Now, back to this, I actually wanted to point out the, um, the AP test mentions three things. I guess I'll do this as a little letter C. Oh, stickers. Uh, Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34th joules seconds.
Thanks for the follow, Micah. Appreciate it. And Pluto. I missed uh, Pluto James. Thanks for the follow as well. Okay. So, stickers from my, uh, my children. <laughs> they like stickers. Okay. Uh, let's do little letter C. So little letter C, um, we need to talk about, <laughs> they are cute stickers. My, my wife likes, she buys cute stickers. So we need to talk about um, uh, absorption. They are at the post office right now. Well, at least my wife had to go drop something off. Um, if they get home before we end, I'll uh, see if they'll come up, but I don't know. <laughs> they're just dropping off some mail you can drop off mail <laughs> so absorption let's talk about absorption so we have i i i i i, I. so we're gonna talk about three things so microwave uh infrared and um ultraviolet slash visible okay so microwave radiation can be used um, when the microwave radiation is absorbed it causes molecules to rotate All right so microwave radiation causes molecular rotation infrared rays it causes vibration okay ultraviolet invisible causes excitation okay so when we talk about it right so we have rotation vibration and excitation um put the thing back where it came from or so help me so help me classic classic um, we, we talked about it in honors, um, but I don't think we've talked about it in AP, which is why I'm doing a, a quick review here. So microwave radiation, infrared, ultraviolet visible. So microwave radiation causes molecules to rotate. Infrared causes vibration. Ultraviolet causes excitation. Yeah, I know. Uh, Mary and Sarah, you guys kind of missed out on having my first year chem class. Um... <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about, this is the one that we kind of want to focus on. Um, this is uh, something we're going to zoom in on and, and talk about. Um, because, let's talk about electron excitation. Okay. Electron excitation and relaxation. So if we remember um, the Bohr model of the atom, we can talk about the energy levels um, where we have one, two, three, four, five, infinity. So our energy levels and we talked about how if a an atom yeah okay Lauren everyone's remembering now um, no no sound and light are different um, sound and light are different so um, if an element or if an electron is in the first energy level and it goes up right this is an absorption uh, and excitation right so if you fire some sort of energy um, if you fire some sort of energy at an atom or a sample of atoms uh, and they absorb energy so if we're using ultraviolet or visible light that energy that's absorbed is going to cause the electron to be excited okay um, once that electron is up here though when it relaxes back down it's going to release a photon 
right? So this process is, um, we call it a release or emission, I should say, emission and relaxation. Right, so there, there's two processes that happen with um, this ultraviolet visible spectroscopy, right? An atom or sample will absorb incoming light and it will excite the electrons, uh, or the atom or sample will release that light. After a while, it'll fall back down and it'll release those photons, okay? This is the foundation for a lot of the spectroscopy that we're going to talk about, okay? Um, this leads into this. Now, this is something that we didn't talk about, and that's this is on me. I'm going to take uh, the fall for not having talked about this. Um, but we need to talk about um, spectroscopy in a little more detail. Um, yeah, I know. Isaac, you know about it because you did the lab at the U, and so you did a couple labs doing absorption and emission spectroscopy. Um, but I don't have the materials to do it really well in the high school. Um, so let's use this and let's talk about um, absorption spectroscopy. Oh, more stickers. Oh, I need to go this way. So let's do little letter E. Um, let's first do... <laughs> let's first do um, emissions spectroscopy. Right. So if you get a sample hot, right? So let's do, you know, some sort of a some sort of a flame. Right. So we have a Bunsen burner kicking out a flame. Okay. So if you have a sample that's inside the flame, okay, what you can do is you can use that 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 flame to, uh, yeah, so what'll happen is the flame will provide energy to excite the electrons. And so what'll happen is once those electrons get excited, those electrons will fall back down. And so this is gonna give out light. Those photons of light will then go into some sort of a detector. That detector will use some magic to give you a graph that looks like this. So if we have wavelength on the x-axis, uh, and it's gonna go from like 400 nanometers to 650 nanometers. That's the visible region, okay? Uh, and then we would have something that maybe, you know, maybe looked like, like this, okay? And then on our y-axis, we have intensity, okay? So um, this is an example of an emission spectra. And so what you can see is you can say, oh, we have this strong peak out here. That's because this corresponds with red. So for example, our sample here could have been lithium chloride, right? Could be some lithium ions. Those lithium ions, when excited, uh, have a gap in their electron energy levels that will produce red light. Okay, so that's emission spectroscopy. Now your peak might be, you might have like broader peaks that absorb across a wide range of um, wavelengths, uh, but something like lithium has a, a very sharp, very um, narrow peak. All right, now we also have to talk about absorption spectroscopy. Uh, and this is the last thing for the notes. I know I'm, I'm getting close to our time here, uh, but this is the last thing we have to put in our notes. Spec, if I can spell. Okay. So, yeah. 
absorption spectroscopy. In absorption spectroscopy, what you do is you take some sort of a light, right, some sort of a light bulb, and you shine light through a sample. Now, this sample is in what's called a cuvette, right? Um. <laughs> okay, so my sample is in a cuvette, and then what happens is light will pass through. It'll go to, again, a detector. Right, and then that gives us again our graph. Now these graphs can be done in one of two ways. Um, they can either be shown. I'm trying to remember how the AP test likes to show these graphs. I think they still do. I think they still do absorption. So on our y-axis here, I think they have absorption. And then on our x-axis, they have uh, wavelength again. Okay. And so for here, we would have something that maybe, you know, maybe goes like that. And if we have 400, up to 650 nanometers, nanometers. Okay, now, if this is still red, right? Uh, I know, yeah. So TJ's kind of on a tangent. We, they, The governor announced yesterday that he's encouraging the continued closure of the schools for the rest of the school year. Um, so I'll, uh, I have a meeting with the principal today to see kind of what direction we're going with it. We'll probably follow it, but there's no official announcement yet. Okay, we got to get through this. Almost done. Um, so light goes through the sample, goes to the detector, and then we get this. Now, if our sample is absorbing red light, what color is the sample? It's not red, right? Because <laughs> if it's if it's uh, if it's absorbing red, that means it's transmitting the other colors. So it's more likely going to look purple or blue. Or maybe even green. Right, so it's somewhere over here because these colors are not being absorbed, and so those are being what are transmitted, um, and so yeah, this leads to this is an important thing we want to we want to get this last thing down. It's called the Beer Lambert Law. Okay, the Beer Lambert Law is that A equals Epsilon B C. It's a fancy E. I didn't do a good job drawing epsilon. Um, a is absorbance. Okay. Um, C is concentration. B is what's called the path length. And then E is a constant, how do they say it? E is a, it's a constant, it's a molar absorptivity constant. Uh, it's a constant for specific substances. So this is our, our beer land bear law, right? Absorbance is the constant for the specific substances, the path length and the concentration. So in a normal experiment, 
if you have the same sized cuvettes, these little you know plastic square containers, they're rectangular prisms that you fill with a liquid. So if you keep your cuvette size the same, then your B term remains constant. If you're using the same chemical over and over again, then your epsilon becomes constant. And so the only way to change absorption is to change concentration. So basically they can say that, oh, if we run this experiment again, right, and we get something like this, right, that just means that we have a lower concentration. Okay? So we have high concentration, low concentration. It basically, the beer lambert law allows us to relate absorption or absorbance to concentration. It says that if we keep the substance the same and the cuvette the same size, then we can um, relate absorbance to concentration. They're a direct relationship. And so we can see that the, the height of the peak is the same as the concentration of our substance. And with that, we could use that to determine you know, what the concentration of some unknown is. And that's it. Okay, that's all we have for today. Um, make sure that you finish the 2016 free response that is up on Canvas. Um, make sure you get that, make sure you grade yourself, give yourself a score. Uh, we will be going over those problems on Friday. So you have to get that submitted by uh, midnight tomorrow. If you have random questions or need extra help with that, I'll be available this afternoon after my meeting as well as tomorrow after my meeting or tomorrow in the afternoon uh, and then Friday morning we'll be going over uh, common questions or working through a bunch of problems kind of like we did uh, two Fridays ago. Uh, a double bond is shorter than a single bond uh, because in a double bond you're sharing more electrons and so that pulls your two atoms closer together. Uh, a single bond is going to be longer. It's kind of a good random side question Maggie. Which also means that a double bond is stronger than a single bond. So a double bond is shorter and stronger than a single bond. Okay, uh, I'm going to go ahead and end the stream. Uh, yeah, <laughs> we're at a long time. Uh, she drew a shorter bond and a long bond. Nice, Lauren. Um, quantum numbers shouldn't be on the AP test. So if your review books are doing quantum numbers, that's not important. Uh, we are going to be doing unit four next, though, which um, I'll get into eventually. Yeah, quantum numbers, we can just talk about with electron configurations. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. You shouldn't need actual quantum numbers. Okay, uh, more tomorrow, more questions. Shoot me uh, an email, ask a question in the Discord, etc. Um, Isabel, I'll, we'll worry about that later. We'll worry about that later. I'll figure it out. We'll figure something out. I, I'm going to get some more info in my meeting. I have a meeting with the principal in an hour, um, so we'll figure all that out. I'll kind of see kind of where we're going with that. So, um, Enjoy the rest of your Wednesday. A nice gloomy day. Uh, overcast skies. Maybe the sun will show up. But anyways, see you guys. Have a great day.